We're coming to today's um, program. Um, we're, we're very pleased to host Paul Midler. He last spoke at the FCC when he launched Poorly Made in China, a real hit business title, which was published in 2010, at, at a time, if you can think that far back, when doubts were creeping in over the Chinese manufacturing boom. And there were growing concerns over quality scandals. Of course, they've only increased since then. Uh, as an advisor to Western companies venturing into Asia, um, Paul related his misadventures in the manufacturing cities of southern China and described this disconnect between the business practices in the West and the East. It's a really entertaining read, if you haven't caught it, and uh, it's still selling well online and on the shelves of Hong Kong bookstores, but um, Paul's also got some copies here which you, he can sign for you after the program. But he returns to us today to launch his second book, What's Wrong with China? And so as well as explaining what's wrong with China, he also looks at why we all get it so wrong when we're trying to read the tea leaves on the country. Um, and uh, along the way, he takes aim at some sacred cows. Um, it's, a very, it's a broad brushstroke rendering of the country that's sure to ignite debate, um, including in our Q&A session later. Um, so I'd like to inv invite Paul to the stage to, to tell us about uh, not only what's wrong with China, but how we get it so wrong on China. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul. Uh, thanks, first of all, for having me at the FCC. I love coming here. It's a wonderful place. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the book and China. Uh, for 20 years, I've worked with China manufacturers. Most of my uh, writing has been about personal experiences of mine in business and uh, in running around China. But every once in a while, I get a story from somebody else who's in China that I find is instructive and interesting enough. And I've also included some of those stories in the book. One of the stories I want to tell you about was from a friend of mine named John, uh, who was from Australia. And I knew him in Guangzhou when I was living there. And he was telling me about some backpacks that he had purchased from a Chinese manufacturer, and the backpacks were meant to be black. And when he got to the factory, he found that the backpacks were actually produced in a very dark navy blue. And so he went to the factory owner and he said, what's going on over here? And the factory owner said, what do you mean? He said, well, I ordered black backpacks, and these are obviously not, not black, they're, they're dark blue. And the factory man looked at the bags, uh, looked at the bag and he said, no, it's, it's definitely uh, black. So John got his computer bag, which was black, and he compared it with the backpack, which was dark navy blue, and he put them together uh, to show him the difference. And the factory man uh, saw this and thought this was the most curious thing in the world. And as an excuse for how things had somehow gone wrong, he said, well, to be frank, in China, pointing to his, his backpack, in China, this color can also be considered black. <laughs> and. and uh, these sort of things are common. If you've worked in China, you, you, these are not news stories. Another one was from a friend. Uh, in the book, I called him Jerry. He was involved in wood. And he had made a purchase of some wood products, and he laid a deposit down. Six weeks later, he went to the factory to see what was going on with the wood. And the factory owner told him, I've got great news. He said, what's the great news? He says, well, I had this other customer. He was coming through the factory, and he saw your wood, and he liked it so much uh, he gave me a really good price, and I sold it to him. He said, well, my customer's waiting for the wood. How is that good news for me? He says, well, he gave me such a good price that I'm going to give you a 5% commission on it. And he was livid, of course, because his customer was waiting for the wood. He couldn't afford to wait four more weeks. And, uh, and, and I said to him, well, that's incredible. They sold the wood that you had paid for, and they gave it to somebody else. And he, and he gave me a line that I, that I loved. He said, well, that's China for you. He said, they'll, they'll screw you, but then they'll work you back into the deal. Make you a partner. Um, I like these sort of stories, and I, I like to trade them when I'm in China with other people who are working on the ground. Uh, un unfortunately, not everybody likes to hear these kind of stories. And there's a lot of people in China who prefer to ignore certain realities of working in China. Very often, I'm talking with somebody who is of that sort, and I'll get a line such as, well, you have to admit it's getting better. And, and I have to, and, I, and, and it's a prerequisite to carrying on with a conversation. You must admit to this person that it's getting better before they will allow you to say what you would like to say next. 
And I, I, uh, I find the line almost uh, offensive. And whenever somebody gives me the line, I always say, well, I wouldn't mind admitting that it is getting better, just so long as we could have a little bit of a conversation about what it is exactly, because nobody wants to talk about it. And, and part of the reason is that we don't have a vocabulary for discussing the sorts of shenanigans that pass for business as usual in China. We don't like to talk about certain things, so we, we give them terms that are vague, uh, that, are, that are somewhat, uh, that obfuscate rather than elucidate. Uh, an example of that might be if you were to ask somebody, what are some of China's biggest problems today? They would say, well, a lack of transparency. When I hear that phrase, I don't even know what it means. Uh, I, I would like to say that I do, but working on the ground, I'm not exactly sure what somebody means when they say lack of transparency. Uh, in preparation for my second book, What's Wrong with China? I did a lot of reading, meaning a lot of research, and uh, stretching back to the 19th century writings all the way through 1920s, 1930s. And um, one of the, if you read books in the 1920s, you'll find a lot of references to Reverend Arthur Smith, who was, by all accounts, considered um, a, a leading authority for the late 19th century. And, and he had a line, uh, speaking of China, where in, in a book that he wrote in 1890, he said, one has the feeling in China that, uh, in China, one never feels sure that he's been told the whole of anything. And, and I always thought that's sort of, I think maybe that's what he means with this, with this business of lack of transparency. And the point being that some of these problems that we're experiencing in China are really age old. And um, for that reason, they are uh, somewhat interesting and, and instructive. I don't know if it's possible to say that it is getting better in China, but one of the things that might be getting better is our ability or willingness to discuss certain things related to China. So for example, when I was in China 15 years ago, and everybody would know this here, it was next to impossible to say anything critical or negative of China or the Chinese. It was a growing economy. The leaders in China were seen as sophisticated, subtle, intelligent, and everybody was extremely optimistic about the opportunity. Um, then the financial crisis hit, the global financial crisis hit, and then people started to think maybe things aren't going to be quite as rosy, and the door sort of cracked open. And, and it, to my mind, the, the first real area of criticism was pollution in China. People were starting to get very vocal about pollution. And they said, you know what? I'm going to come out and say it. China's got a pollution problem. And, and, it was, and it was welcomed as criticism because it was impersonal. And it was a very indirect criticism of Beijing. It was not a direct criticism. And so it, it was welcomed. Other similar complaints involved internet controls, uh, freedom of speech, and then later income disparity. That was another one that was sort of on the table. You were allowed to discuss it if you would like. And, and um, the thing that we forget about these sorts of subjects is that Beijing actually welcomed the conversation. They did not try to eliminate the conversation. Of course, they added some propaganda, but they, they allowed these things to happen. It allowed everybody to blow off steam. It made them look as though they were liberalizing, that they were admitting that there might be some faults. And the people who made those criticisms in these areas felt themselves somewhat proud because they were taking to task an authoritarian regime, and it made them feel um, big and proud that they were able to do that. And the, the, the term that I like to use is a discourse sandboxes. Really, when we're talking about these kind of areas, all we're doing is playing in these little discourse sandboxes. We're really not getting at, at, at the heart of some other related issues. In the 19... Uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s or so, the foreigners who were writing in places like Shanghai at the time, they looked back at writers of the late 19th century and thought that they had lost something, that in an earlier era there was more frankness than there was in, for example, the 1920s. The reasons for that were several. One popular one was that a lot of the people that were doing business in China in the 1920s were not accurately representing the opportunity in China because they didn't want to be called back home. So they sent glowing reports about what was going on in China, and they told the people that they were working for in headquarters that everything's fine. Uh, more interestingly, the missionaries who were working in China in the late 19th century and early 20th century misrepresented their own situation. Uh, it's not a very popular topic of conversation, but there were a lot of missionaries who were killed in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, and those Many cases of murders went unreported because the missions behind those murders did not want to lose the opportunity to quote unquote uh, lose that. They didn't want to lose the opportunity to quote unquote win 
uh, win China for Christ. So th th this did happen, uh, and there's historic record. The fact that we have conveniently forgotten about that says more about us and our willingness to face facts than it does about, uh, about China itself. <clears throat> to some extent, the 1920s and 1930s represented a golden era for China watching, and it is because it was part of a progression from the late 19th century, beginning with Darwinism. Uh, Darwinism led to discussions about survival of the fittest, which by the 1920s was applied to uh, social Darwinism and discussions about what made certain populations around the world do better than others. And there was a sort of frankness that came, and, and even to talk about it, I understand that people are squirming because we do not have that ability today. But in the 1920s and 1930s, people wanted to know what made this group more competitive than that group. And in China, what you had was a very frank assessment, pluses and minuses from cultural perspective, on what made China work versus what made it not work in certain areas. And, and if you excuse certain, what in our mind today might be offensive phrases here and there, what you got was a very frank discussion on what was working in China, what was not working in China in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, the, the, today, uh, well, and then of course, you know, going forward from that, we had that unfortunately, social Darwinism led unfortunately to things like um, discussions of national characteristics led to discussions of race, which led to eugenics, which led to World War II, the rise of Nazism, the Holocaust. And then post-World War II, the continued rise of liberalism brought us to a point where people just decided that it would be better to not open those discussions. It would be better to convince ourselves that everybody was the same all over the world, and that any discussions related to culture would just not be open for discussion. And that, that's fine if you want to believe that, and I know many friends of mine are of that mind. The problem is that it hampers us from uh, discussing certain things. And as a result, we are at a disadvantage relative to our China watching peers of let's say the 1920s, 1930s. There are other modern reasons why we are more inclined to get things wrong than our uh, compatriots of a century ago. And some of those have to do with, for example, social media. If you're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, you're interested in catching uh, likes, you have to be light, sunny, positive. This is, what, this is what people are interested in hearing. They're not interested in digging under the surface and talking about issues. Um, at least not on that, not on those platforms. Another one, and I and I say this with some hesitation because we're in the shadows of the uh, the biggest uh, financial center in in the region. Uh, somehow, in the past few decades, we we've relegated the discussion about China to the economists. And I don't know how this happened, but now everything that happens in China has to be about money supply, interest rates, the cost of labor, and it gets boiled down to these economic things. And 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 to me, it's like. Um, the doctor uh, standing there in the white coat. It, instead of the doctor in the white coat, we have the economist in the spreadsheet. And because we don't know exactly what's being discussed, we just take it as, as given that what they're telling us is accurate, and we accept those. We also willingly accept these explanations because they relieve us of the burden of having to discuss these other things that to us are somewhat more painful, that we don't want to confront. Um, and, I, and I think there is, we, I think that as we move from things like being able to talk about pollution, being able to talk about certain things. The, the question is, what's the next frontier? Because there is a progression. And I think that as, as the need rises, there, there's simply too much to lose here. And if we don't look at what is going on in China, then there are consequences related to that. You know, Right now, everybody's trying to figure out what's going on with tariffs. What, how is China possibly going to respond to, China, to America's actions? And, and the responses are not economic as much as they are psychological, as much as they are cultural. And some, to some extent, you get a little bit of that. Well, uh, the Chinese might be a, a concern of loss of face. Well, that's, of course, a cultural issue. So then how does all of that fit in? The next frontier, as I see it, and, uh, is, is really um, getting past a fiction that a lot of us are holding on to. And, and this may also be somewhat less of a, a comfortable idea, but we're in the midst of this fiction that has us thinking of China as broken up into two parts. On the one hand, we have the communist regime, as some people call it, and on the other, we have the Chinese people. And many people, when they're writing, they portray the Chinese people as wholly innocent and wholly good, and the CCP as wholly bad. And, and I think there's something, there's something wrong there. It's a narrative that's portrayed because it also helps get us out of the discussion of what's going on culturally and, and how does the place tick. Uh, 
It gets us out of that dus discussion, not, not towards it. Um, and as an example of that, if, if you'll allow it, just imagine there's a Chinese government official. Okay, let's say he's a bad man. His wife is not a government official. His wife's not even a member of the Communist Chinese Party. Of course she supports her husband. The children are not CCP members. Of course they support their father. The children have friends. Their friends are circling like buzzards trying to figure out how they can get closer to this man who's, pol who's politically connected. They're obviously supporting him in whatever, he's, whatever nonsense he's up to. It, 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 is, it is a fiction to believe that there is, there is a hard line between this group and that group and that, and that we can somehow get to what's going on in China and main, maintain that fiction. If you want to also look at hard evidence, look at 95% of the Chinese who are in surveys show that they absolutely support their government. This is not, um, this is not some sort of hostage situation. Every government, every people gets the government that it deserves. Uh, we also recognize that. We know that the state-owned enterprises obviously support their government, but there's also plenty of evidence of private organizations that have allowed the Chinese government into their companies and that they, that they tacitly support their government as well. Um, and then, of course, we also have the stories of the uh, thousand grains of sand and all of the people, uh, 300,000 students in the United States, and some of those who are helping uh, the CCP in various ways, as has been reported by other people. No need to go into details here. Um, I, I think uh, one of the reasons for writing the book and one of the reasons for coming here to talk about this is that uh, the reality is that China watchers walk on eggshells, that people, when they talk about China, they very carefully avoid not to say this and not to say that. And it is a subject that we are trying to understand better. It, it would be like, uh, to use an analogy, it would be like a group of meteorologists gathering at a conference and, and tacitly agreeing among themselves that they should talk about weather phenomenon, but maybe they shouldn't talk about typhoons. And maybe it would be impolite to talk about hurricanes. Obviously, the less and less you're able to talk about on any subject, the harder it is to get at what's going, what's going on. I, I think that, um, I think that we're, we are having a, a bit of a difficulty figuring out in China what it is exactly, and that it, it calls for us to be a little bit braver and to extend the boundaries of discourse so that we can try to get a little bit more information and, and really get at what's going on in China. The, um, the costs are simply too great for not doing so. And, uh, and I think that it's not, to, to put a, a cap on all this stuff, it's not any um, animosity towards China that keeps us from discussing the subject. It's actually a love of China that keeps us from discussing the subject because we were, if we were less worried about stepping on toes, we would talk about certain things. But the reality is, is that we're trying to be overly polite. And in doing so, we limit ourselves. And, and in limiting ourselves, we, we fall short. And I know that some people have questions or may have questions. I'm going to go ahead and sit down and join uh, the people here. And um, we'll take any questions if anybody has any. Thanks. Thanks very much, Paul. Yes, so we'll have some questions now. Um, we'll, uh, Victor's going to kick off with the first question, and then we'll invite uh, more from the floor. Please uh, raise your hand at that time. And when you do, if you could uh, let us know uh, who you're representing, and if you can keep your questions short and to the point. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I sort of, listening to you, and uh, you were sort of implying that China was different and that we didn't understand it and you know you used the example from from your earlier book of uh, I think of manufacturing issues and, and anecdotes about manufacturing issues and my question is really whether you know is China really so different from anywhere else that makes backpacks or anywhere else where companies do dodgy things you know whether it's in Europe or Asia or anywhere else um, isn't China just the same but bigger and more important in manufacturing um, and, and related to that, I guess, um, you again, you sort of implied that we were not saying things about China that we should be saying things, that we should be saying. What, what is it that we're, that we're missing? What, what, what are we not being frank about that we should be frank about? So I guess that's two questions. Well, that's okay. Um, so I, I think on the, on the first one is, uh, is China different? And, and that's, a, of course, people have different opinions. My, my opinion after having worked in China a very long time is that it is obviously a very different place. Some of the people that I've worked with over the years um, come to me and they think that doing business in China is the same as doing business in Chicago or Omaha. And, and it's simply not. And I, personally, I find it very um, 
uh, taxing to spend the first year working with someone, just getting them to the point where they understand that they're not in Chicago or Omaha. And, and then after that first year, then we can go on and try to get, get, uh, get business done. If you're looking for an example, I can give you one from a friend who I just spoke with him last week. And um, there was a very large corporation came to him. They were looking to buy a business unit of his in China. And it was a very drawn out process. And he explained these corporates in America, once the decision is made, it goes through a chain of command. And then it's just about signing the papers. They came to the United States. Something happened in the middle of this meeting, which involved, um, I don't know how many people in the meeting, but he was describing lawyers and accountants and various staff on both sides in a very large lawyer's office. And in the middle of the whole thing, he had to go and take care of something brief. It was a very, it was a day long meeting. And he left for a half hour. And the half hour that he was gone, the deal melted because the Chinese side decided to, you know, to bring out the contract and they went to the other side and they said, look, there's six other things here that we'd like to get done. And, and uh, the other team just walked away and he was trying to p figure out what happened. And he went to the Chinese and he said, you know, you guys didn't understand, we were supposed to just sign. He says, no, it's a negotiation, it's an ongoing negotiation. And we've all heard the stories in, in China about how negotiations are always ongoing and that they're never ending. And, and I think that's part of the point. I think the point is that when when it's billed as something favorable to the Chinese culture, it's seen as different and welcome. So for example, the Chinese are seen as, as understanding one another. So there's never any finality. So there's an opportunity to go ahead and talk with each other. So the second part of the question was? Um, no, that's interesting. But I mean, just to, uh, uh, to pick up on that, doesn't that tell us more about people from Nebraska and Chicago being yeah, naive well, than yeah, about well, than about Chinese business practices? I mean, you know, right? He um, shouldn't have, he should have yeah. left the meeting. That was the, that was more. Well, no, but I was thinking not just that, but also right. not you know not understanding the way things work, um, right. despite well, that's, a that's, year of right. advice well, that, from that, someone that's, like you. That's the point. That it's different. That's the yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. The other part was. Um, uh, well, that the other thing was yeah that was that was the main thing really. I mean, it, the other question was more about how you know whether. Uh, you know, you were you were saying up there that we were sort of uh, what's the, the people what, were what generally is wrong? yeah we're, we're not we're not being frank about the issues so you know they misunderstood China and you well, told us in a sense I think what what China wasn't but but I guess what people want to know is is what China is you know what 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 are the things that we should be saying quite frankly that we're sometimes well and some of that stuff is covered in the book I don't know I don't know I don't want to bore people with various things but the, the, the point is that it's very different. And that if you want to understand how to do well in a particular environment, you have to understand that you're dealing with people that are coming from a background uh, that's not exactly yours. They have their own values that may not exactly match yours, and that they have, um, and that you have to understand. This is actually common whether you're working in the United States or anywhere else. You have to understand people on the other side, where they're coming from, and then you can move on to get what you what you're looking for, etc. I don't know. Is there any are there any other questions out there? I don't know if there's anybody at all. Okay. Yeah, from the floor, we'll just uh, wait until the, um, any hands? Oh, oh Keith first, yeah. and then you, uh, and then at the front, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Keith Richberg, I uh, teach at journalism at Hong Kong University, I'm a longtime foreign correspondent, covered uh, China. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, because with, uh, with Trump and, and Steve Bannon and Mnuchin, you're finally getting people now in government in Washington who are saying things that nobody else really kind of wanted to say, like, they cheat on trade. They, you know, they force us to transfer technology. Um, you know, you know, very, you know, you know all the things that they say. Uh, do you think the conversation now is changing? Because I've been surprised that people like Fareed Zakaria, etc., have been saying, "Hey, maybe Trump is onto something here. Let's give this the, the tariffs a chance." I think I think that's accurate, and I think what's happening is we are getting closer and closer to people expressing what they actually mean. And I, I think what's going on, well, I can guess because I don't have a perfect inside inside view, is that I think that. I think there are thousands of business people in the United States who are extremely frustrated with their inability to do well, whether they're selling into China or whether they're buying things from China, they're having a very difficult time in China, they're expressing that frustration to people like Donald Trump. That is what's causing things like tariffs, also balance of trade, no doubt about it. But I think that, I think that there's a political reason, a lot of frustration, nobody's talking about the frustration. It gets translated into things like, we've got to fix the balance of trade. And it, it reads in newspaper. I saw an article just yesterday where it said, what this is really about is technology and innovation and who's going to win that game. And I just don't think that it's about that. I think what it's about is, is ultimately, and I do write about that at the, at, in the book, at the, towards the end, it's, it's um, the issue of frustration in China. And I, I think nobody really talks about that. that. That to work in China, if you've ever met anybody who's done a lot of work in China, you're dealing with somebody who's pretty familiar with how frustrating it can be.
Now, the nature of the frustration can be different from case to case. I understand people in certain businesses have different sorts of frustrations, but that, that seems to me to be a common uh, feature. And it was a criticism of, of my first book. People said, well, you're writing about all these problems and you seem to not have solved certain problems. And, and it was intentional. It was trying to explain that the experience of working in China is almost by definition a, an experience of frustration. And I was trying to convey that frustration in a 240 page book. And some people got it, some people didn't. The people that get it are the guys who write and say, oh, why, you, you described my business life to the T. This is what I deal with every day. Um, there was a, one of my favorite reviews ever, print or online, was a guy who wrote on Amazon. He said, I've been doing metal fabrication in China. I think the line was, I've do, been doing metal fabrication in China for over 15 years, and I could never figure out why in these uh, production meetings I wanted to gouge my eyes out with a wooden spoon. And, and I said, yeah, I kind of get what he's coming. It didn't happen to me. I don't have that feeling, but I know what he's talking about. And that, that sort of frustration is, I think, the source of some of what you're seeing in the newspapers, which are about economics, and politics. But really, it's about, and that's also cultural. That's the American cultural, well, not primarily American, but also Western um, experience in China, which is, which is born by frustration. They don't know how to deal with China because they have different cultural tools. And they're coming to it, and they're getting very frustrated. And um, it's, it's not a small thing. I actually talk about, in the book, personal opinion, I think the opium wars were ultimately about frustrations as well. There was a frustration at learning how to deal with the Chinese. And the line from one of the books that I read, and it was in that book, was that the British found that it was easier to deal with the Chinese by ball and bayonet. That's just, that's just how the, it was. They found it was easier to deal with them by ball and bayonet than through negotiations. Well, also, they captured the, uh, you know, the, the entire the entire trading camp the entire trading community in Canton was kidnapped that sort of helped things too but th that sort of but this is this has to do also with cultural differences where you to your point um, in China and this happens in business as well you you can go online to look for uh, cases if you'd like I can send you examples of cases where Chinese get into a dispute with a buyer who receives faulty goods doesn't want to pay. Then the Chinese says, well, why don't you come to the hotel and we'll discuss it. They invite him to a hotel and they lock the door. And they say, you're not leaving until you sign a piece of paper. And it could go on two, three days. It's gone in some cases longer than that, where the chief representative from the Western side is in China gets, gets detained effectively, not by the police, by the people they're doing business with. And, and from the Chinese perspective, there's no necessary, necessary wrong over there. And you know that, there's, that they feel that way because the police will come in and they won't do anything. They'll say, you guys have to sort it out. Um, well, as long as no physical harm is taking place, they say, well, that's, that's OK. They have, a, they have a right to do that. And I've also heard of cases of companies that have involved, been involved in sit-ins, for example, where it's the reverse, where the Chinese company goes to the foreign company's office and decides to sit in and doesn't leave until a particular issue is resolved. Um, and, and in the book, what I, the way I described it is, is that to the Chinese mind, those, si those sorts of resolutions are considered non-confrontational. They don't involve violence. There's never any physical harm. Um, but to the other side, to the foreign side, the way it appears is very confrontational and very inflammatory. And, and that particular disconnect is one of the things that I think is, is, a, is a cause for concern going forward um, with the U.S. and China, for example. Sorry, I don't know. Thank you. Yes, next question. And you're after that. Thank you, Paul. Um, my name is John Antweiler. I'm retired, but I spent my entire career in banking in Asia. Um, and uh, being an American from Chicago, uh, <laughs> not naive. I, I quickly learned when I came to Asia that there was a big difference between Chicago's perception and the perceptions, be it in Japan or China or Indonesia, Korea. My question is, um, and it kind of goes to what you were saying, is it getting better? And I guess if I were to take out the word it, I would say, are Chinese business practices getting better? Is rule of law more respected? Is our, our investor rights, our creditor rights, property rights, those things getting better understood and better respected? There, there was a, there's a bit in my, in my new book, um, I think if I'm guessing right, 1919, uh, no, actually, I think it was. I think it was um, right before the end of the Qing, maybe 1911. A guy named Edwin Dingle. He was. He wrote a book called um, On China by Foot, uh, 
and he toured China by foot. And his at the beginning of the book, he said, you know, the the uh, the the chant or the call that you hear all over China is reform, reform, reform. And he was very proud to be a witness to it. And you 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 read that and you think, my God, reform, reform, reform. That's all we hear today. So. So what is the difference then between China then and China today? And, and very often, I find there's no difference with, and, and there's another, uh, there's an academic, uh, Harold Isaacs wrote a book about this, where he talks about the, what changes is not necessarily China, but the foreign perception of China, where we go from China as, you know, oh, communism's great, Mao's doing great things, and then all of a sudden we swing, nothing's changed there. We swing from a realization that this is bad, we gotta do something about it, and, and I think some of the swing has to do with economic opportunity. The, greatest, the greater the economic opportunity in China, the greater our willingness to sort of look the other way. And when the economic opportunity sort of slows down as it is now, then people start to say, well, I can't really ignore because I, you know, I don't have the incentive to ignore, so maybe I'll, I'll decide to say something now. Um, but there is a, I think there is a progression. I don't know if it's a pendulum swing or if it's a wave, but there is a bit of a, a movement, and, and Harold Isaacs uh, in, in one of his books did describe that. So I don't know. I think, I think to your point, though, about reform, uh, this came up recently where somebody said, you know, U.S. tariffs, now China this morning, front, of the front page, um, China is going to open China more to um, financial services. It's been announced, they're going to do this, they're going to do this, they're going to do this. So some people say, look, there's not going to be any change. That's a very cynical view. In reality, there is change. It's very minor. China's game is to try to convince all of us that it's making these adjustments and it just does it very slowly so that we just lay off. Because it is what we want is we want China to reform. We want it to be an open playing field that we can all participate in and benefit from. And China's deal is, well, we want to keep it all to ourselves. And in order for them not to you know, charge us, we need to convince them that everything's going forward as planned. So we give them little bits and pieces to make them think that everything is, is, uh, is on a path towards reform. I don't think, and I did cover that in the second book, I don't think on the, on the point of law, uh, reform that we're anywhere near where we ought to be. And, and proof of that is that we have no actual system. In the United States, you have a system of precedence. Um, China has tried to convince us that they are building a system of precedence by starting at the top, and now they have this, this thing where the Supreme Court is issuing uh, precedence. They've done no more than 100, um, and it's just to show us that they're, that they're doing more. I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's too cynical for some people, but that's my perception. I know some people might... Disagree. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's me. Uh, thanks very much, and very interesting um, comments. Uh, I'm jean Biev Hilton from BASF. I wanted to um, ask Victor's question, maybe in a different way. Is China uniquely um, troublesome and difficult, or um, could your book be written about Brazil or Bangladesh or Russia? Or maybe I put it another way, is there a Paul Midler sitting in Beijing writing about how dreadful and troublesome the Americans are? Uh, and, and oh, those guys from Omaha, they'll, you'll never understand. The second part is more interesting. I would like to see more Chinese writing um, in a style that I've written. I'd like to see more Chinese people writing about America. I think that would be very interesting to read. I wouldn't mind reading uh, that sort of comment. I wouldn't mind reading that sort of treatment of China by a Chinese person. And I think that's another topic for a conversation is why we don't out of one point of four billion people, why we don't have more of that sort of thing. Um, and maybe that's part of the problem, I don't know. But uh, on, the, on the, the primary question was, again, uh, remind me, I just lost is it. Is China uniquely troublesome? I, I think it is, long story short, I think it is different. And I, I don't mean troublesome, but I think, I think the China case is different. And I think that, um, and I don't know why that is the case, but I think that if you, look at, if you look at readings from the 1920s, 1930s, and you compare them today, I don't think that they, they quite apply to to uh, to, to Japan. Um, I think there's a, there's a there's a phenomenon I wrote about in the book, which talks about the autonomy of certain Chinese institutions. That the Chinese like institutions that are autonomous. Their idea is to create a very strong central government that oversees everything, but doesn't actually touch anything, um, and that things kind of spin automatically. Everybody sort of knows what needs to be done. I think that's a very I think it's a very Chinese institution. Um, but it's maybe made a little bit clearer in the book than it is going to be here. Anybody else? I know it's the uh, folks got to get back to work. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, you first, and then uh, over there. And anyone from this side? Yeah, number three. Thank you. Yeah, Sandra, I work for a shipping insurance company. I was a bit curious about the social credit system. 
the rating of the citizen. Sure. Uh, do you think this will have an impact on the trade with China? I, I don't really know if that would apply in any way to uh, a Western person uh, yes. trading to Asia. Well, I've, I, as I've written in the book, I, I don't think the Chinese have any systems that are, that are um, in the United States, we have systems that are based on rules and then because we have, you know, if A happens, then B must happen, then C must happen. In the legal sense, sometimes people get put to jail when they shouldn't really be in jail for a very long time because everybody was doing their job. The cop did his job, the judge did his job. There were rules, uh, minimum sentencing requirements. Next thing you know, somebody who should have done maybe one or two years is doing 20. Uh, Chinese don't like systems. They like the flexibility of being able to review every case on its own merit. That is a very Chinese uh, value. So given that, I don't understand how we're going to get a social credit system that's going to be very rigid, where if you do this, then you're going to have this and this and this. I think what you're going to have is you're going to have a very loose system that gives authorities the ability to do what they want to certain people, let certain people go that they want to go and catch people that they want to catch, regardless of whether there's actually justice or basis for it. What I don't like about what I'm reading in the newspapers today about the social credit system is that they're pointing to examples of people who are not being able to, allowed to travel and they're saying that's the social credit system. And, and really what that is is somebody uh, got a judgment, he didn't make a payment, it was quasi-white criminal crime, and yes, they gave him a travel ban. But that doesn't represent a system which is full of uh, dozens of variables acting on one another, pluses and minuses, and, and spitting on a number 623. 546. That, that's not what that is. That's, that's a blacklist. And I'm not saying it's arbitrary, but that's a blacklist. And a blacklist isn't the same as a, as a social credit system. And so there's talk about the social, social credit system, but I don't, I don't see it yet. I, I know there's a lot of talk about it. Um, whatever they come up with, I'm convinced that it's going to be flexible enough where officials who want to get in and monkey around with the number can still do that, because that's China. So that, that, that's, my, I, that's, my, that's my answer. I don't think it's going to be uh, set. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, uh, the next question was. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, David Dodwell, formerly from the FT, um, and uh, uh, um, uh, now involved in trade across the region. Um, first, I'd like to take up the point first made by Victor and then again by, um, uh, by a friend from BASF. Um, but the pushback further. I, I don't see what you're talking about as a uniquely China problem. I thought that. Sorry, one more time. I, uh, I don't see what you're talking about as being a uniquely Chinese problem, um, and I'm sure Victor, having spent time in a long time in India, uh, would be able to recount a similar narrative of the interminable challenges of uh, uh, transacting business in India, for example. Right. Um, and what we have at the heart of that, I think, is something that's common to China, which is the difficulty of jumping cultural barriers and understanding that we, we are trying to export belief systems um, on other cultures uh, without actually spending time thinking about those other cultures and where they come from. I feel sensitive about this on two grounds. One, like yourself, like a lot of people in this room, I've spent most of my working life trying to understand what is going on in China. So I feel challenged by the suggestion that we're not getting it right, okay, defensiveness. Um, but over 40 years, 45 years of moving from a position where n any knowledge of China and Chinese culture was almost impossible to uh, obtain, I today find that we are in a better place to learn in a more nuanced way about an immensely more complex society than most of us uh, have assumed is, uh, exists. Um, and the problem I would define is not that the pesky Chinese are ducking and weaving uh, to, to connive and keep things from us, is that we are arriving with pre-assumptions, with prejudices, and trying to impose those um, in a, in a rather naive and, and blunt instrument way. Um, I, 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 well, I, agree, I agree with much of what you say. I, I do want to clarify that, that um, you can say that different countries are challenging from a business perspective. The analogy to um, being a, a, a diagnostician or a, or a physician would be, look, there, there are two or three 
patients, and yes, we can agree that they're all sick, but this individual's malady is not necessarily the same as this one's. And then, so we want to go and we want to do a, diagno a diagnosis and figure out what is it that makes this particular case different from this case. Um, and I've, I've laid out, I think, in the book a few different areas. I, don't, I, don't, I think if I just drop them here, they'll, they'll be mentioned out of context and won't go over very well. Um, but I think that China's case is different. I think what you said later, though, is very interesting is that, and, it, and I think it's one of those things that gets in the way of our willingness to face facts. The person who has invested 20 or 30 years or more in China does not want to admit to himself or herself that it's been a waste of time. And that's a problem for us. That's a problem. I don't want to admit that I, as much time as I have invested in it, I, 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 I despise the idea that maybe I was wrong to come to China in the first place. So I want to believe that this is all going to work. I desperately want this to, to believe that. And, and the fact that I'm at odds with myself on that issue has been a source of strain, which led me to go and write a book or two about it. But that, that, sort, of, that sort of thing, I, and Rodney Gilbert, this author, wrote in 1926, he, he, he said that as well. He says, because he, he's talking about literature only, and he was, he was in doubt that there were a lot of um, benefits to learning Chinese just to gain access to Chinese literature. But the people who went and studied for however many years it took, 20 years, to get to that point where they could read Chinese literature just as they were reading English, they would never tell you that they had wasted their time and that they were just burrowing through a pile of rubbish. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tell you that. They would tell you that they had, they, they had unfound wonderful treasures. And, and we get this from many Chinese people. I, I have friends that are like this too, that, that because they have a certain uh, ability or they have a certain friend set or they have a certain language skill set, that they have access to something that you could only dream of. And, and, I, and I think that's a fiction also. And as long as some maintain that fiction, I think that gets in the way of getting to the heart of matters too. But I understand where that comes from, and I understand, and I understand the need to want to, to, uh, to justify the time that we've spent. I, anybody, who's, anybody who's spent decades on something wants to believe that there's a payoff. Can um, I, yeah. sorry if I can interrupt, Paul, because um, we've just got time for one more question sure. uh, over on the right, but just before we move on to that final question, it's, an interest, it's interesting that this theme has been picked up um, through a few different uh, uh, questions from the floor. I, I think it comes down to, and if I could just uh, bring us back to, you know, you, you said China is, is different. Can you, can you just tell us briefly why you think it's so different. I think that's the question that we've. Well, it's just like so a, I mean, any any culture is like a recipe. You have um, various ingredients of varying amounts, and so you know. Uh, I mean, um, I, I think uh, I don't know a silly one. I'll, I'll mention a silly one because it's a fun one. But there was there was a uh, you know I I've, I've talked about this in both books actually that sometimes when you're making appointments with Chinese factory owners, you, you have to make them several times. They, they, they will, they need to be reminded of the appointment many, many times. You can't just say, I'm gonna be on the 12th at five o'clock. And, and I had gone back through readings and, and I found that people talked about this at the end of the 19th century, that they would say that a person in China will, will um, first he'll make an announcement, he'll send you a, a card, a red card, and he'll say, I will be uh, pleased to accept you at my place at a certain time and date. Two days before that, you'll get another notice, and then the day of the meeting, they'll send a courier to make sure that you're coming. And, and, I, and I thought that's, that's fascinating because I've had this problem so many times with, with, um, with factory owners. So I say, listen, I'm gonna, can we make an appointment for Tuesday? Just call me when you're in town. I, I, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm talking with you. I wanna know when I can come to town. Just whenever you're in town, call me. You know, and Does I'll that not there. happen in India, Indonesia? I, I don't Estonia. work in India. I, it doesn't happen in the United States. It certainly States. happens in the Gulf. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, um. sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure, like I said, varying degrees and, and of, of, various, uh, of various ingredients. Related to that point, I think we can say Maybe not. I don't know. That the Chinese are uh, inclined towards this is gonna, not going to go over well because it's going to come out of context. But they're inclined towards a certain paranoia. And uh, Reverend Smith, this guy that I mentioned earlier when I was speaking, he talked about it at length, and he said, you know, it's a funny thing. It's actually a, it's actually a bit of a paradox over there that the Chinese believe that anybody who's got secrets has got to be up to something no good, and because of that, they tend to share information as a way to prove that they're not up to no good. So, and, and very, I don't know if you've ever worked with Chinese factories, but they hold their cars very close to the vest in terms of not wanting you to know what's going on. Um, I, I have found that to be a specific cultural trait, but again, I don't have 
the world of experience. Maybe there are other cultures that are, that that treat their business interests that carefully. But I found that to be, um, and, and I found that to be a bit of a, 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 a sticking point with some of the companies that we worked with. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose we should go into the last question. But I just sort of wonder whether this isn't really just about the rise of a new and very strong and powerful trading power, and uh, and the, the loss of U.S. dominance. You know, I, basically, the U.S. has set the rules for decades since the Second World War, and it's no longer quite able to set the rules, both because of China, but also because of Europe. Um, and I just sort of wonder whether that isn't really what it's about. It's about uh, the US no longer being able simply to say, this is the way you should do it. And you can see Trump wants to say that. It sounds and, like that's yeah. a good subject for your next book, Victor. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but we had somebody over there, didn't we? So. Or perhaps yours. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. If we could have the last question, thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Shirley, and I'm a writer. And um, first, first of all, I like to say that I'm, I'm Chinese, and there are certain topics that I'm very sensitive to. So um, your comment on the opium war, I would say that is extremely disrespectful. So um, just want to raise that question, you know, that observation. And the second question is. Um, what we've been discussing here, it come across to me as more or less like a sour grape. Perhaps if we look at successful stories like the Volkswagen that came to China in the early 80s and still running really well in China, making lots of money, and we look at McDonald or Pizza Hut that also have a huge, huge operation and probably revenue as well. I don't know how many zero that is. And so how do you explain that all these companies, international companies, are still in China and making very good profit? Well, I don't, I don't have uh, access to the income statements and balance sheets of all these companies. So I don't know what exactly they're making. I see the brands. If you go out in China and you see a particular brand, whether it's Starbucks or McDonald's or whatever brand you're talking about, you don't know necessarily how many of those dollars are heading back to headquarters. What we do know is that when their presence in China is very significant, it does affect their stock price in a very positive way. And because of that, there are, I'm not saying specifically these companies that I've just mentioned, there are in some instances companies that go into China they splash a bunch of money, they get their brand out there. Because there's a lack of transparency and some people cannot get access to really what's going on, what happens is there's, there's a bit of a wall. It's kind of like having a wall and you don't know what's going on on the other side. You have kind of a vague idea, but you assume that there's a premium on whatever you think is going on. If you think, if you think that there's a big presence and that must mean a lot to the bottom line, that's great. Um, my worry for some of these things is when um, in the event that certain things come to light and some companies finally admit, you know, China was great for us on the stock price and everything, but in reality, it didn't really translate. You know, Taiwan pulled out of the Starbucks deal. I don't know all the details. I know that their, their, um, their uh, licensing agreement was coming up anyway, but to me, that looked like a canary in a coal mine. Because if the Taiwanese can't do it in China with Starbucks, um, and it could be that Starbucks just offered, you know, numbers that were too good to refuse. But I just, uh, I thought that was something, I, I couldn't understand why the, why the Taiwanese would, would back out of that. But maybe there's something there that, that, that who knows. But uh, you know, to your point though, it's mixed trading. There's always gonna be companies that are gonna do better than others in any given market. One of the things that I do mention in the book, which may or may not be of interest, is that there's sometimes a lot of companies in China, you know, I have, I have a friend uh, used to go to Las Vegas and gamble. And whenever he came back from Las Vegas, he used to always tell me, I broke even. And he, it was his story. And I know that when he said he broke even, he lost a little bit of money. And sometimes he, when he said he made a little bit of money, he actually did break even. But there's always a tendency to kind of, in, especially in China, there's always a tendency to kind of suggest that we're doing a little bit better. I've, I've worked with too many companies who are just at break even. Whatever they're spending in China is exactly what they're making. And part of it is because of the setup. And I just don't know. Um, it's, been, it's been my experience. Maybe it's because I deal more with small and medium sized companies. Maybe some of the bigger companies are doing it. I think if you go to, uh, if you want some hard, hard data, you can go to uh, AmCham. Usually puts out a report, and I think there was a, a pie chart, and a fairly significant number of companies that were in China would claim that they were at break even. And I always thought that was a little bit more. It was kind of like, you know, how many times does the coin land on its side? 
Either you're making money or you're not making money, right? But there was a huge pie, it would be like, we're breaking even. And, and I think that that's a bit telling. Um, but again, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm right, I'm just raising issues, I don't know. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone, it's a big topic and not an easy one, and I thank you all for sharing your views. And thanks to Paul for, for sitting in the hot seat there. And uh, just as a token of appreciation from the FCC, uh, if I could thank give you, you our little memento. And thanks